Well, good morning and happy Resurrection Sunday. We just wanted to wish you a uh, joyous and happy Easter. We certainly miss all of you and are looking forward to being able to embrace you again, hopefully very, very soon. Yes, I just want to say happy Easter. Uh, we do miss all of you so much. Can't wait to see you. And I uh, just want to praise God for such a beautiful, beautiful day and being able to look around and see the flowering trees and hear the birds and just be out in nature. And um, we're super excited to be able to share this beautiful day with you. Thank you. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Yo soy Israel García. Yo soy Christopher. Yo soy Daniel. Y yo soy Natalie García. So what are we learning during these times of the pandemic? Uh, it is very uh, interesting to know that at the beginning of the year, my family and I decide to do a, an exercise of doing a Sabbath day, which means we did not engage in activities, uh, work demands, but we just kind of took a day to, to rest and to think about what God is doing in our lives. And I remember how difficult it was at the beginning. It was very challenging. This time, actually, through all these things that are going on, I have nowhere else to go. So I have no choice but to really think more about God. So 
One of the issues that is helping me a lot, and, and we have talked about my wife and I, is Psalm 23. You know, this scripture encourages us because we don't know what David was going through while he was doing the prayer. When he refers to green, green pastures, perhaps, I don't know what he meant when green pastures down in the desert, right? So the scripture says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This scripture really comforts me and I hope that as we take this time to meditate on God, this scripture will also encourage you to know that God is near, to know that we can rely on Him and we can trust in Him. Even though we don't have answers to what's going on, we don't have a, anything to, to, to know that, we don't have a cure per, perhaps for what's going on, but God has that, He understands. I think it's just uh, amazing to see how God is really in control and over like everything that's happening in our lives. For example, uh, just a month ago, I think, I was able to go to the store, to a restaurant, basically not have to worry about getting exposed to the virus, and like in less than a month, he changed all of that, and now we're stuck at home, and we, we can't really go out or anything, and it's just amazing to see that um, that God can just change uh, whatever situation he is and how powerful he is. And um, now I know for a fact that I'm going to be really grateful to go outside once this uh, virus is over. God is teaching me to see that I don't need all these electronics such as the Bible app and music, Christian music, to connect with God. Every day for 10 minutes I just go and sit on the porch right here and I listen to the birds, that's like my music, and I play. This is where I connect with God every day. I think for me one of the things that God has been teaching me during this time is how much I need to depend on God not only in the morning when I have my time with him, but throughout the day, multiple times a day. Um, and it made me think about the scripture in Matthew 4, um, when Jesus is tempted in the desert. Um, one of the first temptations that he had was, um, he was, he had an eating for 40 days, and he's famished, he's tired, um, probably hot <laughs> in the desert. And one of the first temptations that Satan puts in his path is to be um, self-reliant, you know, to go ahead and make these stones turn into bread. And um, it's, it's amazing to see that the way that Jesus responds to that is using God's word. He says, um, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the devil tried again and kept tempting him and he kept using his word, God's word. And the neat thing is that, you know, the devil left. He had no choice but to leave. Um, but in verse 11, which is very interesting because Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, that it says that when the devil left, um, angels came to attend to Jesus. Um, and in so many ways, I feel very like it's relate in that because I feel like I'm constantly fighting temptation to be anxious and to fear and to get overwhelmed and I've had to multiple times throughout the day go to God's Word um, to, to get fed or to get re readjusted in my mind um, but then I also get those text messages and those calls from friends and my community my church community and family and I get I feel like you guys are like angels that God has sent to me to attend to me um, in, our, in my family. So I'm just very grateful for our community um, and just very grateful that we get to, although we're not get to see each other face to face, that we are still connected and helping one another and being angels to one another. Please join, join us in prayer right now for the service. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have together, Father, in distance to worship you, Father. I pray that this service will honor you and will bring you glory, Father. As we are together in our minds and our hearts, 
it will be present to you those who are in, in major need right now, Father, those who are suffering, those who are helping and attending the sick, Father, those who are ill right now. We pray, Father, that you uh, continue to heal, continue to bring healing upon this, our communities, Father, and around us, our family members, our friends, people that we don't even know, Father. There's so much suffering around the world, and I pray that you bring peace and healing, Father. Thank you for this opportunity. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the Capitol Rivers Church of Christ Easter service. Lahu Damesh Hana Hayau Le Ahudo. Dat Marlan, in a natu mashicha, bara de haleha. Anea na. Good Well, good afternoon, everyone, and from my humble living room to yours or wherever you are watching this video right now, uh, I wish you a happy and healthy uh, Easter, and I hope you're enjoying the virtual service so far. Uh, my name is Josh Lilo, and I'm part of the Singles Ministry here at the Capital Rivers Church of Christ. And today, I'm going to be sharing a few quick thoughts from the scriptures uh, before we take communion together. So if you have a Bible, please open it to the book of Genesis. In verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, 
and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Further down in chapter 2, starting in verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So God creates the heavens, uh, the earth, the sky, the sea, the animals, the plants, um, and I encourage you to go back and read the full account for yourself. But when he comes to man, he does something that's never been done before. Something that I personally imagine maybe even the heavenly host didn't even know was possible. God creates himself in the form of a man. A free-thinking, free-willed being with a heart and a mind and a spirit and flesh with emotions and a conscience and intelligence. And this being is created to rule the earth with the same love and compassion, justice and wisdom, kindness and patience as the Creator Himself. From the beginning, God always had one purpose for mankind. He wanted to create divinity. There is one problem, one big problem, <laughs> sin. When Adam and Eve bit into that apple, they opened up a spiritual Pandora's box that allowed sin to live inside of every man and woman who would ever be born on earth. And the best way that I can describe sin is that it's the exact opposite of God's image. Instead of love and compassion, it's hate. And cruelty. Instead of justice and wisdom, it's corruption and insanity. Instead of kindness and patience, it's brutality and pride. And what's so unfortunate is that mankind actually wasn't created to have any of the characteristics of sin. But what's even scarier to me is that sin has been a part of this world and in all of us for so long it's honestly really hard for me to imagine myself or the world without it. It didn't start this way. But from the first man and woman to you and me here today, all of us have fallen incredibly short of our divine destiny. All of us, except for one. In the book of John, in chapter 14, Philip, one of Jesus' disciples, asked Jesus to show him God so that Philip could see him for himself. Jesus responded in verse 9 by saying, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. You know, reading that scripture, I can almost feel Jesus' heart break in his question to Philip. It's as if God, the creator from back in the Garden of Eden, took over Jesus' tongue and spoke directly to the first man he created from the dust of the earth so many years ago. Don't you know me, Philip? Don't you remember who you are? For me personally, what's truly heartbreaking about this conversation that Philip is having with Jesus is that Philip is looking directly at Jesus who is the absolute personification of God, the perfect image of the Creator, the same image that Philip himself was also created to be. He's literally staring at his own destiny, and he can't even recognize it. The Bible says, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away immediately, forgetting what he looks like. 
you know, I think from these scriptures, what I learned is that obedience to God helps us to remember our original image. But disobedience makes us forget it. Divinity was always God's plan for you. And Jesus is the salvation of that plan. In order for us to find our way back to the garden, the same power of sin that stole mankind's destiny, that stole your destiny, had to be defeated. And there's only one man who was able to defeat sin with his life, death, and resurrection. He is mankind's champion. He is our Lord and Savior, and today, He is risen. His victory is your victory. And with that victory through baptism, we have the forgiveness of our sins along with the gift of the Holy Spirit and God's grace, which together empowers every disciple of Jesus to have their image reborn into God's image. So as we take communion, let's all resolve to lead our friends and our families, our neighbors and our high schools, our companies and our colleges, our country and this entire world with love and compassion, with justice and wisdom, and with kindness and patience. Because when we choose to do what is right, we're choosing to be like God. We're choosing to return to His original plan. And we are embracing our true image and destiny.
Well, good morning and happy Easter, happy Resurrection Sunday. Um, you know, this is one of my most favorite times of the year. And um, I have the uh, privilege of being able to shoot this particular sermon uh, sitting in my own backyard. And uh, I hear birdsong all around me. I see flowers coming to life. Um, I was sweeping the patio a little bit this morning and it was so warm and so beautiful. And I'm watching the grass just get greener and greener. And all around me, I see signs of abundant life. And I think that fits so well with our theme for today and so well with what we've been talking about from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and even the great job Brian did last week talking about the way God made us to create and God created a world that is phenomenally beautiful and capable of sustaining life. And so I hope that my thoughts this morning are inspiring to you and encouraging to you. We're going to be continuing our time studying from the book of Genesis uh, on the theme of the Resurrection Sunday. I want to suggest to you this morning that the book of Genesis is intimately connected with the resurrection narrative. That Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are deeply connected to Revelation 20 and 21 and 22, and they're deeply connected to what happens later on during the Easter narrative in the Gospels. In Genesis chapter 1, we find that God is creating. And many, many times in that chapter, it talks about God creating things, God making things. And in every single one of those instances, it uses simply the phrase Elohim, the phrase God. And God said, let there be light. And God said, let the land produce living creatures. And God made, and God said, and God created. And in every one of those instances in Gen Genesis chapter 1, you have that singular pronoun, and God. God said. And the word there is Elohim, which simply means God, or deity, or spiritual being. But as we've been talking about, when you get to Genesis chapter 2, what I suggested recently was that what you have really is a change in point of view. And that you have a second creation narrative told from the vantage point or from the point of view of the earth. And so Genesis chapter 2 in verse 4 begins this way. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And of course... In the English Standard Version and other more literal translations, it says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And I spoke to you at midweek about this word being toledote, which really means gene or genetic, or to be from or to be of the same essence or the same birth father as. And so here in Genesis 2, what we've been talking about is that the earth has her own story to tell in the creation account of man. But I also believe that the earth has a magnificent story to tell when it comes to the resurrection and to the new life and the life that is to come as well. So if you were to take and highlight all of the times that the phrase God appears in Genesis chapter 2, you would instantly see something very unique. And that is, in difference to Genesis chapter 1, every time we come across something that God is doing in Genesis chapter 2, his name has actually changed. 
No longer is it simply God did these things, but beginning in verse 5, speaking of the shrubs, it says, the Lord God had not yet sent any rain on the earth. And the Lord God, in verse 7, formed man from the dust of the earth. And in verse 8, the Lord God plants a garden east of Eden. And it's the Lord God that makes trees. And it's the Lord God that does all of these things. And all of a sudden, there's a difference in the way God is described and spoken about between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And lest you think this is simply a Bible nerd observation, let me suggest this to you. What I think is happening here is now we have, in the beginning, God's point of view of what God was doing, and now you have the earth telling her story of what God is doing, and because the earth was created by God, the earth now addresses God not just as Elohim, but as Yahweh Elohim. She calls God, in some sense, by his proper name. She pays him reverence. She pays him honor. And she calls him, you are the Yahweh God. You are the only God. And that simple change of voice, I think, suggests something spectacular, which is that earth is alive and filled with the presence of God. And earth that we think of as inanimate and not alive is actually very much alive and very much a creature much like everything else that God created. The earth herself bears witness to the glory of God. The earth herself bears witness to the power and the creation of God. And I believe the earth herself bears witness to the resurrection glory and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A number of times in the Old Testament, the earth is also personified, sometimes in the poetic literature like the Psalms. But very interestingly, in Leviticus chapter 25, in verse 2, the Bible says this, Speak to the Israelites and say, When you enter the land that I'm going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years sow your field, and for six years prune your vineyards and gather your crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a Sabbath of rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Later on in Leviticus chapter 26, God also says something similar. He speaks of the land enjoying its Sabbath years and now he's talking about what might happen to the Israelites if they continue not to obey him. And God foresees a time when they will go into captivity and he says this about the land. Once you go into captivity and your land is laid waste, the land will then enjoy its Sabbath years all the time that it lies desolate and you are in the country of your enemies. The land will then enjoy its rest and Sabbaths. At the time that it lies desolate, the land will have the rest that it did not have during the Sabbaths that you lived in it. Now I find this very, very interesting. We know that the Israelites were commanded to observe the Sabbath and that God created the Sabbath to celebrate rest and to celebrate the completion of all he had done. Have you ever considered the fact that the earth was actually owed a Sabbath? That the earth actually earned in some sense or deserved the Sabbath? And I think one of the things that's perhaps going on here is God is telling the Israelites, you need to treat the earth like you treat a fellow Israelite as something I have made, as something that's beautiful, as something that has life in and of itself, the land deserves a Sabbath, just like you deserve a Sabbath. And you almost get the sense that God is treating the earth as another character in the narrative, not something inanimate and something just there or just dirt or just a thing, but a living entity that has the power to generate life and deserves the same kind of treatment that everything else that's beautiful and good that God created deserves. We find this idea also in the New Testament. Interestingly enough, in Luke chapter 19, in verse 40, this is the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ coming into Jerusalem right about the Easter time that we celebrate. And what the Bible says as he's going on up into Jerusalem, he instructs the disciples to go into the village and get a donkey, and he begins to ride that colt into Jerusalem. And in Luke 19, in verse 35, it says, they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks upon it. And he came up, came into the, Jew, the city of Jerusalem. 
And when he came near the place where the road goes down towards the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And I'll be honest with you, I have typically read this as a metaphor. As Jesus simply saying, no, my greatness is so great that if my disciples are silenced, the earth will sort of come to my rescue. What I now believe is that Jesus might have been actually serious about that. That the earth has the power to proclaim God's glory. I'm not suggesting that the earth may open up its mouth and say hi to me tomorrow. I'm not suggesting that the earth has a language like English or French or Spanish. What I am suggesting is that Jesus, in line with ancient rabbinic theology, in line with the greatest principles that we see in the Old Testament, understood that the earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the seas. So we see that Jesus is in line with ancient philosophy and the ancient teaching of the rabbis. He's also in line with the theory and the theology of the psalmist. In Psalm chapter 19, in verse 1, the psalmist famously says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. They pour forth speech day after day. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech and no language anywhere where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. And then the text goes on and it talks about the son being like a bridegroom traversing the pavilion on his way to meet the bride. All throughout the Old Testament, the earth is seen as a living entity, as a character in God's great story. And by now you're thinking, this is all very interesting, but what does this have to do with Easter? What does this have to do with what we read about in the New Testament? I believe that what God is suggesting here, He is preparing us for the idea that someday the earth, just like we, will be regenerated and given back to man to be a perfect place. It will once again be the garden of life, the garden where there is no evil, the garden of knowledge, and the garden where man can dwell forever in personal, close, intimate proximity and communion with his God. Paul is very familiar with this idea. In both Romans 8 and 2 Corinthians 5, he discusses it at length. Let's go over to Romans chapter 8 and look at this very familiar passage against the backdrop of Easter. This passage is very familiar to us, Romans chapter 8, and a favorite of a, of a number of us, I'm sure. And it makes some amazing promises, both about the Holy Spirit and about the way God loves us and is intimately involved with us as His people. But I want to focus our attention here on verse 18. The Apostle Paul says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will someday be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And then very poignantly he says in verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly await for our adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. And hope that is seen is no hope. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we can wait for it with patience. And of course he goes on and speaks at length about the Holy Spirit. But I want to train our attention here on verses 19 and 20. Paul says here something fantastic. He says that the entire creation, everything that God has made, is groaning and waiting for the sons of God 
to be revealed. He again is personifying everything else that God has made. And I think what Paul is simply saying is this, everything that's fantastic and beautiful, everything that God has made was waiting for the moment when true followers of Christ would be reborn into the kingdom of God. And the earth was waiting for that moment and waiting and hoping to rejoice because once the earth watched us do that, the earth realized that her time of redemption was coming sooner. The text goes on and it says, the creation was subjected to frustration and is going to be liberated from its bondage to decay. And again, you get this powerful image that the earth actually knows what is happening to her. That all of creation has this innate sense that it's going somewhere. That it's not for nothing. That someday everything God has made will join with the Christian and join with the followers of Christ in being reborn and recreated into a glorious eternal future where God will be all in all. He goes on further and he talks about this as though it were childbirth. This is a very, very apt metaphor. One of the things we understand about childbirth, and for those of you who have given birth, it's incredibly painful. It's incredibly difficult work. It's hard. It, it takes a long time. It can be exhausting. But, but we push through because there's this anticipation of something fantastic on the other side. We push through because there's the anticipation of a new life and that the labor and the pains and the effort and the care and the time and the sorrow and all of the hard work that goes into giving birth to new life, it's worth it because what you get is new life. And I believe that the creation is also feeling these things. Paul is talking about the earth and he says that the earth is also waiting to be reborn. The resurrection of Jesus Christ makes all of these things possible. Finally, when we go over to Revelation, we see the ultimate fulfillment of all the promises of a resurrection. In Revelation chapter 21, the Bible describes our future state. And you'll notice that it looks an awful lot like a garden. And it looks an awful lot like Eden. And it involves not just humans, but also the earth and everything else that God created all the way back in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. The Bible speaks of the city of God this way, laid out like a square, it says, as long as it is wide. The foundations of the city, I'm in Revelation 21 in verse 19. The foundations of the city wall were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation is jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedon, the fourth emerald. And you'll notice all of the, all of the same language from Genesis, the precious stones and the gold is here. There's no temple in the city because God is its temple. The gates are never shut because God has no enemies in this place. The glory and the honor of the nations are brought into it. And then out of the center of it, Revelation 22 and verse 1, comes the water of life, the river of the water of life. Clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God, down the middle of the street of the city. Verse 5 says there's no more light. They don't need light because the Lord God will give them light. We're all the way back to the garden now where light is the first thing that was created. I think the metaphors of new heaven and new earth here are deliberate echoes of the Genesis account. I think what's happening here is the earth, just like you and I, is receiving everything that was promised to her. We are not going away to some distant place to be with God. God is coming back to once again dwell with men. And where will we do that? Not in a disembodied state, but in a very real set of bodies, in a very real earth that's brand new and everything that's beautiful and everything that's good and everything that we need and everything that was perfect in the Garden of Eden will once again be ours and we will share that and live with God forever and ever. Brothers, sisters, friends, Easter is about something so much bigger just than the resurrection of our bodies. It's the resurrection of every body. Heavenly bodies, earthly bodies, human bodies, supernatural bodies. Everything is made new because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God who formed the heavens and the earth 
God who formed our bodies, God who formed all of creation, doesn't leave anything to decay. The effects of sin will be eradicated from all of God's creation, and all of us will be together with God to rejoice forever. That's the promise and the hope of Easter and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I wish your family a great and prosperous and exciting Easter day. I hope that these thoughts have encouraged you and inspired you and have called you higher to worship God, the resurrected God, who is Lord of heaven and earth and has done all of these things because he loved us. Happy Easter. Washed bed. I'm going.